people to the kind of tri-state region. And not only that, we see people take up a lot more space. We heard a lot this morning about habitat fragmentation, mainly due to things like subdivisions and, and suburban and urban developments. And I think that really um, begs the question, how do wildlife species respond to that? And that's a, an issue or a question that comes up all the time in wildlife management circles. How, how does a species respond to change? And even though it's quite simple, it's a difficult issue to actually understand. Or a difficult question to ask. So in this case, we focused on the bobcat. Bobcats, uh, many of you probably have had direct experiences with. The bobcat is uh, a secretive and generally nocturnal species, despite this picture. Um, and are usually pretty low in density, so they give the illusion of being pretty rare, but they do occur throughout the state and do happen to be a species of greatest conservation need here in Vermont, a medium priority one. So our objectives are really twofold. Our first was to estimate how many bobcats there are in the state. So we frame that around carrying capacity. What's the maximum number of bobcats that we have in the state? And the second is, how might that carrying capacity change? How might that population change under a, a scenario of, of um, in 50 years' time, in 2050, that, that would reflect what the, what the conditions would be like given rates of housing and ro road development that we expect to, uh, expect to happen. So uh, we set out to do this uh, using a combination of empirical field data and modeling. And so I'm going to walk quickly through the methods here. I don't have a lot of time, but hopefully you'll be able to follow. So the first thing we did is we collected information on bobcat home range and habitat use. So we wanted to understand the spatial requirements of bobcats. What are those things that they need? So some of you were involved uh, in, in this uh, study a few years ago that radio collared some cats, sent them out, and the telemetry data that came back was used to estimate home range sizes and the characteristics, the habitat characteristics beneath those home ranges. Then um, we took the patterns that we observed in the habitat ha uh, use uh, beneath home ranges and we built a habitat suitability model. And that's just a little mathematical expression that allows one to go to some spot on the ground apply that model and it gives you an index. It gives you a value, a score for how good or what the quality is of that um, piece of land for a bobcat. So we developed that model, we applied it on a pixel by pixel basis to this map that you see here of, of Vermont. So again, that gives us a, a measure of quality for the entire state. From that then we estimated carrying capacity or the total number of bobcats that could fit given that suitability map of the state. And we use a technique called maximum flick analysis. I'm not a mathematician, but it is a mathematical technique. It's an extension of graph theory. And I'm just going to walk very quickly through how that works. So here's a map of Vermont. We're going to zoom in on this little piece of, of the Champlain Valley here. You see it here. This is a raster, a pixelated image of the habitat suitability map. The black areas indicate high scores, really good areas. The white areas are pretty low and not so good. So keep this in mind just for a second. We're going to go back to the home range information that we got. We took our real home ranges. We put them on our original habitat suitability map. And from that map, we averaged the scores underneath home ranges. And that average score gave us a threshold. So that value would be required, we assumed, to support an actual home range me so far? So then we went to our snippet here and we started at one pixel and we looked at the value, the score of that value, and if that value was above the threshold, we rescored it as a one, meaning that that pixel could support a home range. We then went to the next pixel in this map, and if that value was below the threshold, let's say zero, then, uh, sorry, below that threshold, then we scored it a zero. In other words, it couldn't support a range. So we took all of our new ones and zeros and transferred them into a new map of red dots and white dots. So the red indicate those pixels that could support a home range. And then from there, we overlaid on each one of these dots an actual home range, a pseudo home range. 
And given what we know about the size of home ranges, we plug down all of these gray circles that you see underneath the blue circles. But there's not a lot of biological reality to this because we know that bobcats are a territorial species. So clearly we couldn't have this many bobcats existing in this small landscape. And that's where the click analysis comes in. And the long and short of it is what it does is that it's an algorithm that will look at every single possible combination of non-overlapping gray circles to try to find the maximum number that could fit within this landscape. And so the solution to this little snippet are the blue circles that you see there, which is the maximum number of bobcat home ranges that could fit in this little landscape here. So we did this now um, under present conditions, and we also did it under future conditions. And so we simulated a landscape in 2050 using some other models that project housing and road development that have been used widely by others. And so we created this simulated map in the future, created a new habitat suitability map, and did the same click analysis on top of that. So in the end, we had, we had two different sets of numbers, the number of bobcats under current conditions throughout the state and the number of bobcats in 2050. So as part of this radio tracking study, we ended up um, collaring 10 males and four females, mostly in uh, Chittenden County and I think Addison County as well. Male ranges are about twice the size of female ranges, uh, which is a common characteristic of cats. The habitat suitability model was really driven by these factors you see here, so forest cover, shrubs, and wetland, as well as roads really dictated the quality of a piece of the landscape for the species. What we found when we ran this across the whole state, um, we estimated a total of 1,150 bobcats, 835 of which were females and 316 of which were, were males. And then when we projected into 2050, we had basically the same numbers. And that was really surprising to me, especially in light of the kind of development we're expecting to see here. Um, and that could be due to various things. For one, bobcats are not as sensitive to landscape development, urban and suburban developments, the way that other species are. Um, and it also reflects the fact that um, they may, um, you know, they're fairly generalist. They may, they may do uh, just fine in a changed uh, uh, landscape. I would say that um, I think the, the general conclusions for this study are that we did extend um, uh, this, this approach to a huge region, to a giant landscape, the entire state of Vermont, which I think is, is a first, and it gives us a glimpse of really how many animals probably live in this landscape. Of course, there are always um, you know, caveats that come when you start projecting into the future, and we certainly could have gotten that wrong uh, as well. I think there are a couple of applications when thinking about uh, action and policy that, that come from this, and I almost think this is more important than the actual Bobcat results. The first is that we can use this click approach, and even though it sounded quite complicated, we have a nice package now that can do it pretty quickly and cost efficiently um, for any territorial species. So when there's a need for understanding the size of a population, the number of animals across Vermont, for territorial species, I think we've got the capacity to do that. So that could involve species like fisher or other harvested species like red foxes or coyotes or mountain lions, which don't occur. Well, depends who you ask, right? So it could be applied to any number of, of different species, um, and it requires a couple of pieces of information. It requires something about the size of a territory or a home range, and it requires something that links um, the species to the landscape. In other words, some kind of way of quantifying habitat quality for a species, whether that's a habitat suitability model, an occupancy model, or some other kind of suitability index. The second point is that um, it does provide a framework for assessing, I think, any kind of change to territorial species. 
we looked at urban urbanization and the effects on bobcats, but that could be shifted to any, again, any kind of landscape change. Climate change, for example. Climate change might impact habitats in certain ways, which then could be used to generate a new map, a new suitability map, and to quantify the impacts that um, those changes might have on a species. So I think I'm almost out of time. I'm getting flashes of, of uh, color here, so I just want to recognize many people that were involved in this work. Of course, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, the uh, co-op unit uh, of USGS, UVM, uh, and Rubenstein School, a number of individuals, some of which are mentioned here, but of course there, there are plenty of others. Um, and with that said, that's just a quick snapshot uh, of, of this project, and I'm happy to answer any questions now or, or after. What habitat characteristics are you looking at, and which ones are the high-quality ones for buckets? We looked at, uh, gosh, a whole suite of different um, factors. I think the high quality ones were like um, some of the forest cover, like um, uh, evergreen and, uh, and deciduous. Um, wetland, some wetland habitats were actually uh, fairly significant. So, so dense shrubland areas you said? And, and shrublands as well. So the, the base layers that we used across the landscape were defined by the, the uh, National Land Cover Database. Um, and they have pretty discrete uh, categories that have um, definitions to them, so we relied on those. But it was some forest cover, shrubs, roads had a negative impact, um, and wetlands also had some kinds of wetlands had a positive <coughs> impact. And I, I can share those specific results. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the numbers. You said 1,000? Like, 1150 across the state. From the trapping stations, it seemed like there was something like 100 uh, carcasses available to a friend of mine doing a study. Does that sound like a sustainable number of trapped and low killed animals? Uh, well, um, to me, I'm not sure. You know, you'd have, you, you know, that gets into the realm of population modeling and, and really is dependent on survivorship and number of offspring and so forth. It sounds a little high to me. Yeah. I was frankly surprised that the number was just above 1,000. You know, this is a Small state, but there's a lot of territory there. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess the, the numbers were surprisingly lower to me, um, and I think that's something maybe to consider, uh, you know, in terms of establishing harvesting quotas and so forth. Mm -hmm. okay. We can do one more. You know, one more question? Yeah. Hi, Ken. Uh, hey. Um, did you notice uh, home range change based on the habitat quality? And if I mean, if you have uh, lower ha lower quality habitat, or these cats trees are required to have a larger home range, and is that part of the projection of future fragmentation and development? Um, yeah, I mean, home range sizes were variable, and we had a you know a relatively small sample size. Habitat use was not random, so ranges were configured around areas that had pieces of high quality. Um, but there still was a, a pretty good amount of variability um, within them. I think habitat configuration might be another issue that might dictate the way ha uh, home ranges are distributed. One thing I didn't mention, though, is that we did try to account for variability in home range size and the quality beneath them um, by building this model in a stochastic way. So. When that click analysis ran, and we ran it many times, so we had multiple simulations, each simulation would, um, would use a specific home range size and habitat suitability threshold from a distribution that was based on a variability that we saw. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, but it did provide for some flexibility in changes in home range size and habitat quality. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.